And this is coming from the same team that brought you the game Villagers of the Oakdale, and both of these are roll and write games, but they do play very different from each other. They both look like a ton of fun, so definitely check this one out if you are a fan of Roll and Writes. And I am excited to show you this one because the publisher was nice enough to send me a copy, which I do have set up here in front of me. And yes, they do have some pretty cool components here with a sword marker as well as a shield that you'll be using to help draw straight lines, which I'll come back to in a minute here. And I should mention that these are prototype components and what you'll end up with with the final version of the game will look a little bit different than these. And although these do look really cool, the final version will look even better. And I have this game set up for two players, and each player is going to be taking a player sheet, which they're going to be using to track their health and items. And then each player is also going to be taking a dungeon sheet, which they're going to be tracking their progress through the dungeon. On the left here, we have a bunch of different monsters that players will be encountering throughout the dungeon. And at the start of the game, each player is going to be drawing a level 1 monster from the level 1 stack, and then taking that into their supply. And just because of my limited space here, I'm just going to show what I have in front of me, and you can just assume that there is a second player here. And now that I have this monster out in front of me, it does allow me to attack that monster, but it can also allow that monster to attack me. And this is one of my favorite aspects of this game, because I think this is a really cool mechanism, and I'll come back to it after I explain how the action selection works. And for that, we're going to be using this action board way up here, and the way this works is that one of the players is going to be rolling all of the dice, and then you're going to be assigning them to their respective locations by matching up their colors and numbers. Each die corresponds to the section it's adjacent to, and the outer perimeter here indicates how many movement points you get to spend on your turn if you draft that die. And then the inside location here with all the different shapes and colors is going to be matching the different shapes and colors on your monster sheet. You might also notice that the monster sheet has a black die and a white die outlined in the bottom right here, and this correlates to the amount of damage that the monster can do depending on the die that you drafted. Normally you'll find that the black dice put you in more danger, but they also are the dice that can grant you more movement points. Collecting the different potions will allow you to check those off on your inventory sheet, gaining you access to those potions they can use later. And the potions can do different things, like increase the amount of damage you do to an enemy, decrease the amount of damage it does to you, or make additional strikes against the enemy. There's also these different locations that have torches on the wall, and if you're able to end your movement next to one of those torches, that's going to allow you to reduce the value of your die by 2 when it comes to the enemy attacking you. Taking a look in the bottom right corner of the monster card, you can see that the amount of damage that the enemy is going to do to you is determined by not only the color of the die, but also the value of the die that you drafted, with 5 to 6 giving you either 2 or 3 damage in this case, and then 3 and 4 giving you either 1 or 2 damage. Since the torch lets you reduce that by 2, it's going to be taking it down one of those levels. There's also some torches that are just laying around in the dungeon that you can pick up any time that you move through them. And when you do this, you're going to be marking it on your player sheet in order to keep track of that. And these work exactly like the torches on the wall. The only difference here is that you get to carry them along with you and use them whenever you want. You might have also noticed that some of the spaces do have a chest in them. And these are normally locked behind a door, but if you're able to get the key and get to that chest, this is going to allow you to circle one of the pieces of gear on your inventory sheet, which will gain you access to that special upgrade. Of course, a dungeon wouldn't be a dungeon without some traps as well, and that's what these different spikes represent. And any time that a player moves through those spikes, you're going to be taking as much damage as the current level of the dungeon that you're in. The different levels are represented by the different type of flooring that you'll find in the dungeon, and there is a legend at the bottom of the sheet that will let you know exactly which type of flooring correlates to which level of dungeon. One thing to note about the traps is that there is a sneaky way that you can get around them, and the way that you do this is by using all your movement points for that turn, but then end your movement on a trap, and that's going to allow you to stop on it without triggering it, and then you'll be able to move from that location safely in your following turn. But I think that gives you a good enough idea of the base rules here for me to start taking my turn, and for my first action I'm going to go ahead and draft this black 4 die because it does give me 4 movement. And then it will allow me to start attacking the enemy, starting from the green triangle, which I'll explain in a second here. Since that gave me four movement, I'm going to be moving through here and ending my movement on a trap, which will allow me to move through it safely, like I mentioned before. 
but it did also get me a potion as well, which I can use at some point in the future. But now that I've completed my movement, I can go ahead into the attack phase where I'm going to be attacking the monster. And since I drafted a die from a space that has a green triangle, this is going to allow me to land a blow on the enemy potentially by drawing a line starting at any of the green triangles. I can connect to any other icon that I want to, I just have to start from a green triangle. And in order to actually deal damage to the enemy, the line does need to cross over the enemy at some point on its body. You might have also noticed these other icons next to the monster, and if you're able to also cross the line through any of those, that's going to allow you to gain that item or upgrade. And I should mention that when you are deciding which other icon to connect to, you're not allowed to double check with your ruler to see if you're actually going to be hitting the monster, or if you're going to be hitting one of those icons that you're aiming for. You just have to use your eyes and use your best judgment. And once you make your decision, you have to stick with it even if it didn't land the way that you expected. That being said, there is a potion that does allow you to check any of the lines before you draw them, but I don't have that potion at this point in time, so I'm just going to go ahead and start from this green triangle up here, and then I'm going to connect to this red icon over here. Now that I've committed to that, I can go ahead and put my ruler on there and draw my straight line which does hit the monster, and it also hits this icon. Because the icon I crossed through matched this icon in the center here, it's going to allow me to move up this skill track. And these skill tracks are nice because any icons that connect to any of the spaces that you've unlocked are now available for you to use at any point in the future. Because the one I just circled is connected to a torch, that means I can go ahead and use that torch at any point in the future by crossing it out on the sheet here. And I'll just give you a closer look at the monster sheet now that I've crossed the line through it. And I should mention that I haven't successfully done any damage to the monster yet because crossing a line through it does not deal damage. In order to actually deal damage, you need to create intersection points on the monster, which means that I need to draw a second line. And it also needs to intersect the line I just drew. And it also needs to intersect on top of the monster. And now that I've done all I want to attack this monster, the monster is now going to retaliate and attack me. And since I drew a black die with a value 4, it means that the monster is going to be doing 2 damage against me. But since I did just unlock that torch icon, I can just go ahead and use it, which is going to allow me to treat my die as if it's reduced by a value of 2. And now the monster is just going to do 1 damage to me, and I mark that by just crossing off one of those broken hearts underneath the health track there. And the way that the health track works is that the number of colored hearts indicates your total health. And once you catch up to that by crossing out that many broken hearts, then that means you've lost all your health. Your max health can be increased in order to try and avoid that, but if your health does go down to zero, you'll have to skip the movement action on your turn in order to gain two health back. And a really nice thing about this game is that turns are simultaneous, and as soon as I drafted my die during my previous turn, my opponent would have drafted their die immediately afterwards and then taken all their actions as I was performing mine. But now we both get to draft our second die, so I'm going to say that I pick this one and they may have picked that one. And this one's going to allow me to move two movement points, so I'm going to move through this torch that I'm able to collect. And I should probably show you what I'm doing, so I'll drag this up here and I'll actually move this a little bit closer to the camera so you can see exactly what I just did. And the die drafted was next to another green triangle, which isn't the best option for me, but I guess I'll start at this one and end at the blue. So let's draw that line, which does move me through another icon, which I can check off here, which gains me an extra health. And as a nice bonus, we do now have an intersection point on top of the enemy, which will deal damage to them. So they're going to be getting one point of health taken away. Then the enemy is going to do damage to me, and then me and my opponent are going to draft one more die and do that sequence over again. And once all the players have drafted their third die and completed their actions for that turn, that's going to be triggering the end of the round, where all the dice are going to be collected and rolled again, and then set out on the board in order to start the next round. But the game continues like this with players moving through the dungeon, gaining all sorts of different items and gear, and then attacking their enemies. And when you do bring an enemy's health all the way down to zero, you're going to get the reward outlined in the bottom left here. And then you'll be discarding that and replacing it with a new monster. And the level of monster you draw is determined by your current location within the dungeon and which level that space corresponds with. If you end up using up all the different icons around the monster and you still haven't defeated them, 
then instead the monster is going to run away and you're not going to be getting the bonuses from that card, but you still do draw a new monster in its place. The way that you win the game is by completing the objective of your chosen scenario, and there's two different scenarios offered in the prototype that I have here. The first one, and the one that I'm playing with right now, requires you to visit the three shrines marked with these stars, and then trade in the appropriate stat there in order to destroy that shrine. The first player to destroy all three shrines wins the game. The other scenario comes with a different dungeon card, and the way that you defeat this one is by reaching the boss's chamber, which is marked with a star here as well. And once you've reached that location and you've defeated the current monster that you're facing, then instead of drawing any of the other monster cards, you're going to be drawing a boss monster. And to win that scenario, you need to be the first player to defeat your boss. I really like this game and it plays very different from any other roll and write that I've ever played, which is a breath of fresh air because I do find that a lot of roll and writes do feel a little bit samey. So if you are a fan of roll and writes or if the game just looks like a lot of fun to you, I do recommend checking this one out because it might be bringing something a little bit different to your table. I did also mention that this is their second roll and write and their first one was called Villagers of Oakdale and I did cover that one back when it previously launched, and I do expect that you will be able to get it either during this campaign or during the Pledge Manager, so if you are interested to know what their other roll and write plays like, I'll just go ahead and roll that previous footage for you now. And of course, I do have this link down below if you do want to click to get notified. And the game plays over 12 rounds, but each round you're going to be rolling a pool of dice, and there's going to be dice of a few different colors, with each of the colors being associated with a certain quadrant on the action track. Each of the quadrants are also broken down into smaller segments, with each of those segments being associated with a different value of the die, and of course offering you different actions to choose from. But what most of these actions are going to do is grant you resources that you'll then be able to cross out on your own personal player sheet. But there's a bunch of different resources you can gain. There's the pickaxe that allows you to fill in different cells within the mine section, which will grant you victory points for filling in different rows and columns. And of course, there are certain areas that will grant you other resources. So there is a cascading effect that can happen because when you fill that in, you'll be able to gain access to that other resource, which can allow you to fill in more cells on the sheet. And this concept does exist in other areas you'll be filling in as well. The wood resource allows you to expand your town, but then also to build buildings around the perimeter of your board. And the nice thing about building these is that building production is going to be triggered on certain rounds throughout the game, which means that the more buildings you have built earlier, the more benefit you'll get from them over the entirety of the game. But there is one more thing you have to do in order to build your buildings, and that's to unlock those building locations. And in order to do this, you'll be using the roads resource, which will allow you to fill in different paths along the road, reaching these different flags which which represent the building locations, but then you'll also be gaining any bonuses from icons that you're able to reach, as well as bonuses for surrounding complete sections of the land. And the last resource we have is an interesting one because this one is actually the villager resource. And this one can be used in one of two ways. It can either be used as a worker or as a knight. If you're going to be using it as a worker, you're going to be filling in one of these villager spaces. At the end of the round, you're going to be moving up this track equal to the number of the workers that you have filled in in that row. But the nice thing about this is that those workers go to work every single round. So if you fill in all three of those, you're going to be moving up three points on that track every single round. And you can probably see that you'll probably end up maxing out that track pretty quickly if you do get three workers there. But if that's the case, you're actually going to be earning gold for each space that you can't move up that track, which is going to earn you victory points at the end of the game. One thing to note here is that each of these rows are also associated with a different color die, and they're only going to be activated when that associated die is chosen for that round. So even if you fill up one of your rows with three different workers, if you don't choose that die, that track is not going to move up. But now let's get over to how the knights work, which are going to be protecting you from attacks throughout the game, which if they go unprotected will give you negative victory points at the end of the game, because any time that a 1 is rolled on any of the 4 die, it's going to be causing an attack to all of the players and indicate that you're going to be filling in the sword icon at the top of the board. But if you spend one of your villagers as a knight, you'll be able to fill in the next knight on that bottom row. And any time that your knights are ahead of the swords, that means that you're completely defending against all of the existing attacks. 
but the game essentially continues like this with players rolling their dice and then using those dice to perform various actions out on their sheets and like I said there'll be a ton of cascading effects and there will also be some objective cards that players will be trying to complete throughout the game as well which will kind of change your strategy from game to game and those do grant you additional victory points if you are able to complete them. So if this one does sound interesting to you you can definitely check it out I have it linked in the description below and of course you can click to get notified.